Tonight, Trump the Nihilist, fighting terror in the Philippines, and... The internet can be a terrible place. The National Transportation Safety Board released new information today on the moments leading up to the Amtrak train derailment that killed three people in Washington state. The train's final speed clocked in at 78 miles per hour. That's 48 miles per hour faster than the designated speed for that area. About six seconds before the accident, the engineer made a comment about what officials describe as, quote, an overspeed condition. The NTSB looked at video footage and said it didn't see the crew using any personal electronic devices in the time frame it reviewed. Fancy Bear, a hacking group linked to the Kremlin, targeted at least 200 journalists, publishers, and bloggers from mid-2014 until a few months ago, according to an Associated Press investigation. About 50 were from the New York Times. Hackers also went after foreign correspondents based in Moscow and Russian reporters working for independent media. The AP said it obtained a hacking hit list from a cybersecurity firm and that journalists made up the third largest group of targets after diplomatic personnel and U.S. Democrats. The FCC is planning to impose a record $13.4 million fine on Sinclair Broadcast Group for failing to disclose that it was paid to air certain stories and programs. An anonymous complaint to regulators alleged that Sinclair aired stories paid for by the Huntsman Cancer Foundation during newscasts, without telling viewers that the material was sponsored. Paid programming was broadcast more than 1,700 times during the local news and as 30-minute segments, according to the FCC. In a statement, Sinclair said it would challenge the fine and that, quote, any absence of sponsorship identification was unintended and a result of simple human error. This week, a white farmer became the first to get his land back under Zimbabwe's new government, a major shift from the Robert Mugabe-era policy of seizing land held by white Zimbabweans. Farmer Robert Smart was greeted by the black farm workers who used to work for him and had also been evicted from the property. Mugabe's land reforms started in the 1980s and were positioned as a way to address the inequality of colonial land ownership. But many contend the measures gave way to cronyism and ruined the economy. The first visit of a British foreign secretary to Moscow in five years quickly turned into an extraordinary public confrontation over Russian meddling in foreign elections. During a press conference with Secretary Boris Johnson and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. My friend Boris Johnson recently said that he has no proof that Russia was involved in the referendum on the exit of Britain from the Eurozone. Not successfully is the word that uh, I think you need to use. He's afraid that if he doesn't respond to me, he will be damaged by his own reputation in the eyes of the mass media. I, 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 Sergei, it's your reputation I'm worried about. <laughs> Today was the final Washington workday of 2017. President Trump kept it short, signing the GOP tax bill and making the usual hyperbolic claims about it before heading off to Mar-a-Lago. We're going to bring back probably $4 trillion from overseas. Uh, nobody knows the exact number, but it's massive. It'll be over $3 trillion. It could be $5 trillion. This is exactly the public face of Trump we've come to expect. Perfectly willing to say things that may or may not be true, but that sound really great. And more importantly, perfectly willing to do things that are in essence, just high stakes rolls of the dice. Trump spent basically the entire year focused on two things, doing everything he could to erase the Obama legacy and taking his chances on really drastic moves whose outcomes are completely unclear. Thank you. It's a kind of dangerous nihilism that's become the dominant mode for this White House. This tax bill is a great example. It offers huge tax breaks to rich people and corporations, very little to everyone else, and blows a massive hole in the deficit. I guess it's very simple. They're selling it as a driver of massive job and wage growth. A lot of economists are doubtful the new law will lead to that. The administration and the Republicans have pulled the trigger on this thing, despite the warnings, and now we're just gonna have to hope they got it right. Look at Obamacare repeal. Trump and the GOP tried to do this on the level, but they failed. So the president decided to sabotage the healthcare system in other ways. 
refusing to allow government payments that helped keep the cost of insurance down, and going along with repealing the individual mandate as part of the tax bill. And we've essentially repealed Obamacare. Uh, you know, the individual mandate is a very big factor in this bill. By simply chipping away at Obamacare, Trump has brought a ton of uncertainty into American health care. This could lead to a bipartisan repeal effort, like he's promised it will. But there's no evidence that it will. Trump is trying to change health care policy through a kind of, let's see what happens if I do this approach. That approach and the uncertainty have already led to higher insurance costs in a lot of states. Then there are the decisions that Trump makes on his own without Congress getting involved at all. Like this one. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. While making good on a campaign promise, he also pissed off a lot of the world, including, of course, the Palestinians, who vowed to cut the U.S. out of the Middle East peace process and created dangerous situations for those serving overseas in diplomatic and military roles. It's not like other presidents haven't been confronted by the choice of whether to move the U.S. Embassy. But what other presidents have done is study what could happen and decided it wasn't worth a boatload of long-term problems for short-term political gain. Trump just pushed the button and walked away. Until now, caution has been one of the basic laws of the presidency. American presidents have incredible power and a healthy fear of making a huge mistake has always been a kind of natural check on that power, like gravity. So far, this White House has been operating in anti-gravity. But next year's an election year, and if voters decide they've had enough of Trump's reckless style, there could be a pretty harsh fall back to earth. If not for Trump, then for the party who put him in power. The United States has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world, and the numbers are rising, even though the CDC estimates that nearly 60% of those deaths are preventable. But in California, the maternal mortality rate is just a third of the national average. One big reason why is a simple but powerful innovation that's keeping mothers alive in the delivery room. Vice News spoke to one of the doctors who came up with the idea. My first year of fellowship, I got pulled into a case. Any maternal death changes the providers in the room when you first see it or you're first around it, it's just devastating. Everybody questions what went on, but not like you question yourself. You know, what could I have done different? What should I have known? I still think back on it. I um, still can picture the room. Unfortunately, you just don't forget that. In California, we do about 500,000 deliveries a year. That's about 40 or 50 families that are gonna lose the mom. Again, I, I know that's not popular for patients to think about. They, they want to look at the happy side of things. When you look at causes of maternal mortality, there's sort of the big three. We knew hemorrhage was always up in the top three. And it turns out 90% of cases where the mom dies with obstetrical hemorrhage, you can look at that case and say, hey, there's something we could have done sooner or something that we could have done differently. So our first task force was to develop a toolkit, a collection of things that we could get into hospitals and into the delivery setting that would help the providers intervene quicker and sooner. We came up with the hemorrhage toolkit. When a mom is in a delivery setting like this or in the operating room, the uh, plastic tubing that's needed to give a transfusion or a balloon catheter that uh, we put into the uterus to stop bleeding, those are stuck here, stuck there. Medications are, you know, different places. So by putting them all in a tool kit, you could just roll that into where the event was going on and it made, it sped up the process. In California, the fact that we've been able to lower ours and the national rate continue to climb says we're, we are doing something different here that other states are not. 
This hospital does about 4,500 deliveries a year, so it definitely is less than a dollar of delivery. The bottom line, it's a win-win for everybody. That hemorrhage cart should be in every hospital in the country. More than half of all consumer goods contain the same ingredient, palm oil. The palm fruit's derivatives are almost endlessly adaptable. And today, the average person goes through 17 pounds of them every year. But that soaring demand has a bleak downside. Massive deforestation. Millions of acres of rainforest in Indonesia and Malaysia have been cut and burned to clear the ground for giant palm plantations, driving forest species to the brink of extinction. Just one country has managed to take on the industry, Norway. In 2011, Rainforest Foundation Norway launched a campaign under the slogan, Don't Eat the Rainforest. They directed consumers to a guide showing which foods contained palm oil, so they could boycott them. It galvanized a massive outcry against the food industry. The campaign itself was simple. But Lars Lerville, director of the Rainforest Foundation, said finding out which companies to name wasn't. Palm oil is used in thousands of foodstuffs, and it can be used in 1% or 30% or 50%, and you cannot often see on the label uh, if there is palm oil in it, because it's often disguised as vegetable fat or vegetable oil. But Norway has a freedom of environmental information law. It means companies are required to disclose the impacts and ingredients of their products, if anybody asks. I mean, nobody had really heard about palm oil. It's, it's not a thing that people talked about or knew about before the campaign. So what really happened was that this created enormous interest among children. And in less than a year, palm oil consumption in Norway per capita dropped by two thirds. The whole country got involved. On public television, children learned to survey ingredients for palm oil derivatives. Famous bloggers started mass candy boycotts. Det ville aldrig ha skett om inte förbrukarna, alltså mig och du, hade visat att man faktiskt bryr sig om miljö och hur gott det är att maten vi kommer från. And the country's biggest supermarket chain released commercials for its palm oil-free foods, starring marching red-eyed palm villains. But the influence of the campaign now stretches far beyond the grocery store. This summer, Norway's parliament passed legislation to stop public entities from using palm oil in biofuels. The problem is that Norway's success didn't put a dent in the global market. In the three years after the Norwegian campaign started, production increased around 14% worldwide. According to Emma Learley at the US-based Rainforest Action Network, that's because consumer boycotts have limitations. When we talk about boycott campaigns, which is what Norway has run, is that sadly, the palm oil market is not diminished by that. If anything, they are continuing to expand into new areas. Ultimately, it's not the responsibility of each individual consumer it should really be the corporations that are purchasing this palm oil. It took five months for the Philippine army to drive ISIS-linked separatist groups out of the city of Marawi. In that time, the battle displaced 360,000 people and left more than 1,000 people dead. It also exposed just how vulnerable the Philippines has become to extremism. Now, the military is intensifying its fight against terrorists, and it's called for reinforcements. President Rodrigo Duterte is partnering with Malaysia and Indonesia to launch air and sea patrols throughout the region. The new front in the fight against ISIS-linked terrorists is patrolling the same waterways that foreign fighters have exploited in the past. Terrorists from different countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, were reported to have passed in these waters. This is a vast uh, sea lanes that um, is very difficult to patrol. We first met Major Rowan Remus in Marawi during the height of the battle. Sounds close. He 
now oversees this multinational strategy at sea. What happened in Marawi is um, an eye-opener for us. So we are um, learning from it and improving our capabilities to prevent similar incidents and prevent terrorists uh, to come in our region. The government has been criticized for allowing Marawi to happen. So you see this as the government taking steps to be proactive in combating terrorism before what, it takes a hold? Yes, what is happening right now is um, we are in increasing our capabilities in combating uh, terrorism. That is the marching order of our uh, commander-in-chief to uh, prevent incidents like what had happened in Marawi. Even though the Philippines is putting a lot of resources into keeping terrorists out of its waters, the real fight is taking place on land. This remote island is the stronghold of Abu Sayyaf, the brutal extremist group with ties to ISIS. Leading the fight here is General Cyrilito Subihana, the commander of Joint Task Force Sulu. Most of the members are from here. They are very much familiar and uh, they have uh, just some amount of influence over the people here. Subihana has fought Abu Sayyaf for three decades and has the battle scars to prove it. I have a shattered uh, forearm. They put a metal aim plate that long with five screws. So it was shattered. No bones hold my, my hand anymore. I have uh, bullet wounds on my arm, my head on my stomach and on my buttocks. So I have five gunshot wounds all in all. Do you think that there's something inherent about this area that means that this kind of terrorism is going to exist for a long time? One is poverty. When the Abu Sayyaf started their kidnapping activity and uh, they get ransom, they shared uh, the ransom money to the community uh, nearby. So uh, in exchange of money, uh, the community provided support to them. Since he took command last year, Subihana has scaled up special forces patrols and pounded militant strongholds with more than 2,000 rounds of artillery. But the enemy is so entrenched in the community that the military has now turned to local civilian militias who are more familiar with the land. Why do you feel like you need civilians to train here? Actually, these people uh, know the, the terrain, know the place, they know the enemy. They, they report the, the presence of the terrorists in the area. And they're used to fighting this uh, menace in the province. After 45 days of combat training and target practice, these militiamen get paid by the government to fight alongside the military on their home turf. And these people are, are, are permanent residents here. Few soldiers to lead them, they can fight the terrorists here. Mm -hmm. Is it a concern that, I mean, Abu Sayyaf does have a strong presence on this island and the weapons you're providing them, this knowledge and training you're providing with, could easily end up in the hands of Abu Sayyaf? No, we don't worry about that because uh, we don't employ them by themselves alone. We employ them with our regular forces. And we, so we ensure that uh, they, they move, they fight uh, alongside the regular forces so we don't lose uh, necessarily these firearms. 500 have graduated so far and an additional 200 will be trained in the coming months. But for all the stepped up military presence, the troops haven't been able to cut off Abu Sayyaf from its main revenue source, kidnapping for ransom. This is where a lot of terrorist activities take place and we're trying to find a family down here because we've heard that several members of this family have been kidnapped in the last few days. Frederick Trinidad showed us how 11 armed men surrounded his home and kidnapped his parents and four other family members just three days before. Yung una nagluluto yung kapatid ko at saka tatay ko. Yung nanay ko dito naka, nakaiga. Yung una, pumasok, sa, pumasok yung mga tao, taong yung tinuto, tinutukan nila yung kuya ko. Sabi nila sa kuya ko, pasok, pasok, pasok. Did the six of them who were taken try to escape? Did they try and run? Sila makatakas kasi tinutukan na sila ng maril. To try and raise the $3,000 demanded in ransom, the family sold this house. But if they still can't find the remaining cash, 
the kidnappers are threatening to execute the hostages. How does it feel now that your parents are gone, being here alone? It's hard for me because my parents are gone. I don't know what to say. 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 Abu Sayyaf is able to keep terrorizing local communities and make money off kidnapping, the more it will continue to pose a threat to the entire region. We sat down with a member of Abu Sayyaf, who allegedly smuggled explosives and ammunition for the group in the run-up to Marawi. He's now locked away in this overcrowded prison with more than 100 other suspected terrorists. Prison officers were present throughout this interview. The prisoner says he's speaking to us of his own free will. Is what happened in Marawi helping Abu Sayyaf or is it harming them? For their purposes, I think they succeed. The government is saying that this is a victory for them. Mujahideen has no losses. Even though they will lose in battle, even though they will die, they will still win. Why? Because they have rewarded by God. So let me just get this straight. You believe that Abu Sayyaf members were doing Allah's work? Yes, because all the deeds are uh, uh, written in the Holy Quran. But there are hundreds of innocent Christians, innocent civilians who did nothing to these men and they killed them. In that case, if the war begins, you cannot avoid that. Is this the end of extremism in the Philippines or is this the beginning? It is just a beginning. So Marawi was a success? Yes. Without realising it, many people and things spent the year vying for the title of 2017's biggest villain of the internet. A title which I am about to bestow. Let's take a look at the rogues gallery. When talking about villains of the internet, it's hard not to look past Donald Trump's Twitter feed. Whether it was insulting a foreign leader, a typo-ridden complaint, or a typo-ridden typo, Trump's Twitter posts also served as a harrowing substitute for a morning alarm for millions. Twitter itself is, of course, a contender. While saying it was fixing its harassment problem, the premier outlet for the id of the internet doubled the character limit for double the harassment and made it easier for anyone to compose an endless tweet storm. Facebook's supreme ruler, Mark Zuckerberg, spent a large part of the year on his Why Would I Run For President When I Already Own All Of You tour, where he met everyday regular Americans, some living lives blissfully untouched by Facebook. And here's a sentence that could only exist in 2017. He was forced to apologize for this virtual reality high five given against a backdrop of disaster stricken Puerto Rico. They could have sidestepped this PR, VR, faux pas and PR if they just sent Snapchat's hot dog to report from the scene. Credit reporting agency Equifax was hacked via a security flaw they hadn't bothered to patch, compromising the private information of 145 million people. See, what's funny about the whole thing is that Equifax executives knew about the hack for weeks before telling everyone about it. And then after they told everyone about it, someone went ahead and made a fake version of their customer support page, which Equifax themselves linked to. <laughs> All of it makes Equifax less a villain and more an incompetent gatekeeper of the sensitive personal information of millions of people. McDonald's makes the cut for a cynical social media cash grab that weaponized the intense fandom of a subreddit. When police had to be called to McDonald's locations across the US, where crowds had become unruly due to a shortage of Szechuan dipping sauce. Szechuan! That was once created as a kind of racist tie-in to Disney film Milan, that's since become popular thanks to a running joke in cartoon series Rick and Morty. They, they created a new sauce for the McNuggets called Szechuan sauce, and it's delicious. The Szechuan shortage led to calls to boycott McDonald's and an online demand for sauce sachets that sold for hundreds of dollars. To be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand Rick and Morty. It was a banner year for white supremacists online, as they crawled out of anonymous trash sites like 4chan into mainstream trash sites like Twitter. But they did give us this timeless video, spurring the internet to debate whether it was okay to punch a Nazi, which, let's be honest, is probably one of the more substantive philosophical conversations of the year. 
The dozens of sexual harassment and assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein spurred America's fathers of daughters, husbands of wives, and even sons of mothers to suddenly speak out against the harassment that they'd always assumed was legal in Hollywood. But Weinstein's example demonstrated that swift action against someone who's a subject of multiple allegations is possible, and those claims spurred the Me Too movement, one of the few positives that came out of the internet this year. A strong candidate for most reviled figure on the internet has to be FCC Commissioner Ajit Pai, who made good on his promise to kill net neutrality in December. But with this video released the day before the FCC vote, Pai was able to convince us there are things on the internet we don't necessarily want to be able to freely access in the future. Is the biggest villain on the internet, in fact, the internet itself? When you think about it, the internet was the ultimate enabler, allowing everything I've just been talking about to exist. No, the villain of this year is Bitcoin. Its astronomical increase in value convinced people to purchase it without knowing what it really was or that it's not a real coin, even convincing some it was worth mortgaging their house for, a thing they previously only did to buy another house, default and crash the global economy. The internet can be a terrible place, but it doesn't induce you to throw your money away. Compared with Bitcoin, sending insulting tweets to world leaders for free, from the comfort of the home you still own, just seems like harmless fun. That's Vice News Tonight for Friday, December 22nd, and for 2017. We'll be back on January 2nd, 2018. Happy New Year.